All right. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview, and we are joined today by Ali Garced. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I'm stoked. I'm ready yeah. to do this. Yeah, me too. You know, we have a great mutual friend, Shelby, that introduced us. And you know, I've been following you, following your content on Instagram, everything that you're doing. And, and not only are you kicking ass, but it looks like you're having fun, dude, which is always amazing to see. Yeah. I, I'm in the right career field. And I never thought I would say that. Like, I, I thought this, like, you know, loving your work was just a dream, some sort of like made up shit, but it, I'm in the right career field. Yep. I love that. I love that. So you're in Tucson, Arizona. <clears throat> um, yes. and all right. So, I mean, you've only been in this, this is going on your third year, correct? Yeah. yeah. The end of this month, we're in July, 2023. This is the last month of my second year. Okay. Yep. So you did, you know, jumped in first year, 20 deals. Now you are mm -hmm. part-time, you're full-time in the air force, part-time in, in real estate, your first year. Then you ended up transitioning full-time into real estate, doubled your production, your second, you know, that next 12 months and on pace to double again, you know, this year. Um, and all things we're going to talk about here, 92% of your business coming from social media. So people are coming to you. You're not having to chase. You built this attraction-based business on pace to net over 300 grand this year where most in this market that I'm talking with, because of transaction volume decline, are just massively, massively struggling. You know, so I love seeing, watching, and, and learning from agents like yourself that are crushing it in these different challenging times. So um, let's just kind of peel back the different onions of, of, of your career. So let's talk about your first year, you know, because there's a lot of people that, you know, are obviously we all started somewhere, you know, um, but during that first year, plus the fact that you're part time, because that's a way that a lot of realtors start. You know, what was that like? Because I mean, 20 deals, your first year out of the gate, plus with the fact that you were part time is extremely impressive. So kind of walk us through like what you did, how that went for you. Yeah, I, I will say the biggest motivating factor for me was knowing that I needed to leave my W-2. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I the, the amount of pain that I had like in my W-2 finally outweighed the uncertainty of me working for myself, of me having doing something else, like changing my entire career. Cause I was a federal agent and now I'm a real estate agent and I love it. You know, I've tripled my income. It's, it's amazing. So becoming an entrepreneur was very, uh, risky, you know, which is why I wanted to do it while I was still active duty air force, while I still had my W2, I told everyone that I knew, Hey, I don't have my license yet, but I'm about to be, a, I'm about to be a realtor. So when you're moving, hit me up, think Allie, real estate, Allie, the agent, Allie, the agent. And that was my conversation every day. As soon as I realized, you know what, I'm going to try this realtor thing out. I told everybody I knew I was going to be a realtor. So I was already top of mind within my sphere, which is a very lucrative sphere to be in the military community when you're a realtor, because people are moving every three to six years. So what better person to, to help them buy and sell than someone who is also active duty, or at least just still speaks their language. So I, I told everyone that I knew I got licensed. And then at that point, once I started, um, I had one goal to, to know for sure that I was going to leave the air force to do this. And that was to match my income. Well, I, I guess two, can I match my income of what I'm making as a, as a major in the air force? And number two, do I like it? And I did it. I matched my entire salary of $107,000 in the first eight months of me being a realtor, which is I was part-time. I was solo. I was, you know, like the only one out in Tucson within my, um, EXP group. And all we needed was the checklist, you know, like you just have a little bit of faith in yourself and discipline to do what you, what is needed. And man, it, it took off. So hopefully this episode like resonates with someone to like put a little like pep in your step and like get going because our, uh, I hear that six, like the average realtor's business has gone down at least 40% this year, 2023. And mine has only gone up. And I don't say that to boast, but like, it's, it's just the discipline, like focus on what you need to do and there's business everywhere. Yeah, no, I love that. And we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, I definitely want to unpack that and jump into that. But before we do, when you mentioned that, all right, like you had, you were experiencing that pain and you need to get out of that W-2 job. Because a lot of times we don't go through the pain of change until the pain of the status quo outweighs the pain of the change. You know, um, you know, for those that, you know, are maybe going through that, like what, what allowed you to get to that point? What was so painful 
about the W2 that allowed you to get to that point where it's like, all right, I'm going to do whatever it takes here. Yeah. I, I don't want this to sound like I'm bashing the military, the views of my military career, like we're on my own, my own, you know, my views are not representative of the DOD, but I had uh, enough was enough. You know, I had, I had done a volunteer deployment when I came back. Um, I had done my initial four-year commitment. I extended, you know, a year, I did an extra year of volunteering for deployment. I came back from Afghanistan. I figured at that point, this is 2017. I've done my time. I paid back my ROTC scholarship. I think I'm going to separate now. And my separation was denied. Never did I think a separation could be denied because I did everything they told me to do. Hey, volunteer, get some street cred, do this, do that. I was always saying yes to opportunity because that's the person that I am. So my separation was denied, even though I never signed any paperwork. I didn't sign a contract. They verbally told me, hey, this is the next assignment. Uh, you know, think about it. And I was like, okay, yeah, it sounds, it sounds all right. So I verbally said yes. Uh, but I never, I purposely never signed paperwork. And they said, you verbally saying yes, was you was equivalent to you signing a legally binding contract. That was news to me. So it was, that was like one of the, one of the biggest factors at that point. I'm like, Hey, I really have no autonomy over my life. Now I have to move to Tucson where I didn't even want to be here. Um, I actually don't even love Tucson, you know, but I'm making it work. I mean, it's the military, you know, you sign up for what you sign up for. And I, 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 that was just one example times, you know, every year there was something similar where it just proved to me over and over again, I have no power over my life. I have to ask somebody else to go on a couple of days of vacation. I could never take two weeks off. And now I'm taking, I took almost the entire month off and I'm still making money. And so that's, that's what got to me. I'm like, Hey, my, my parents are aging. I'm across the country. I'm originally from, originally from New York. Um, I want to be able to do what I want to do. If I want to smoke pot, which I hate, I want to smoke pot, you know, like yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't like it, but you know, just, I wanted to be able to, I wanted to do things for myself, take off time when I needed. Uh, so at that point, the, when I was moved to Tucson, Arizona, um, I took a lateral assignment because I fell in love and we got married. Uh, so instead of me promoting, you know, right away, a year and a half, I was supposed to be in Tucson that I was supposed to go on to my next assignment. Every two years I was moving and I, it was, it was a lot. I was spending 180 days out of the country, uh, you know, just doing stuff, counterintelligence in Spanish. And it was, it was exhausting. So taking more power back over my life now that I'm still in my prime, you know, I'm in my thirties. Send me to Afghanistan when I'm 80. You know? yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do it now. <laughs> yeah, 100%. All right, so, so you know, you, you get to that point where, okay, enough's enough. You jump into this. Um, how, what did you do to, to manage your days, manage your schedule, you know, and whatnot, to be able to get to, to replace that income so then you could go full-time? And again, this is just for those that are maybe in that situation because it's, you know, it can be tough balancing both. It definitely is. And I will say I, I lucked out with the position that I had where my boss was not co-located with me. So again, I'm in Tucson, Arizona. My boss was in San Antonio, Texas. So I was a one person shop at the time I worked uh procurement fraud for like all of the Southwest for air force. I, it was a lot of work, a lot. Um, but being that I was doing a mixture of remote work and in-person work, I'm still talking to people. I I'm still talking to a lot of people, military and civilian with some sort of like air force nexus. So I knew very early on that my goal was to have six conversations about real estate every single day in order for me to make an average of $308,000. So that was my number. I just stuck to that number every single day. I woke up and I thought six, who are those six going to be? And those are not six new conversations. Those are, I did a mixture of three nurtures and three new. So um, knowing that at some point during my fraud time, you know, during my federal agent stuff in the military, I'm going to talk, you know, we're building rapport, smoking and joking. I'm going to talk real estate and I'm, I'm telling everyone that I know, Hey, I'm actually about to leave. I'm only going to be in this position a, a year more. And they're like, what's the next question? Oh my God, what are you going to do? Are you going to go work for the FBI or, you know, wherever else everyone thought I was going to do? I'm like, no, I'm doing real estate. And everyone's like, <laughs> what? You're going to leave, you know, having a gun and like all this, you know, quote unquote, like power. You're going to be a realtor. You're going to show houses. I'm like, yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, okay. They're like, actually, you know what? My mom's moving. Do you think you could help them? Yes, I can. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it was. Every single day, my number was six. 
Now, are you, uh, are you still following that methodology? Yes, 100%. Yep. I actually have it on my whiteboard. I could probably show you after it's in my yeah. closet over here. So I, I had it hung up. I became obsessed, like obsessed of, of making sure that this worked because otherwise I still plan on separating. What the hell was I going to do after that? If, if being a realtor didn't work, I, I knew that I had to make this work. So it wasn't like in order to double each year, it was just a compounding momentum of these six conversations and obviously you're getting better with the conversations and get some referral business in there too. But it's just that kind of compounding momentum of doing what you started out of the gate that is just continuing to add to this growth. Yeah, definitely. And while I first started my first year, I was, it was less referrals, although, well, actually it was like 50, 50 referrals and those like me working with buyers and sellers. Um, and my second year was, and now I am mainly a referral agent. And that's because I had so many clients, me talking to them, as many people as I could. And the power of social media where I can talk, it's not one-to-one -one anymore. It's one to however many, you know, a thousand, um, I can, that my message goes out further. So I, it was in the middle of, you know, my work day where I was talking real estate, I was showing homes during the weekends, uh, at night in the evenings. And it was, it was a lot of work. It was completely unsustainable. Could I do that for two years? Probably not. I would have burned out. I was already starting to burn out my year one, but I just wanted to make sure I can, I can make the income that I, that I was making previously. Yep. Love it. So then, um, all right. So with these, with these six conversations, you know, you mentioned, okay, like half nurture, half, so that's at least three new conversations with three strangers that you haven't had, you know? So I know that those watching and listening, the next conversation is going to be like, okay, like how did you initiate those? How are you going after those? You know, is that just something in the grocery store or is it more intentional with like, I don't know, calling Fizbo's? I never got into cold calling for, uh, for sales because I already had a lot of, I, I really just utilized my sphere, like bottom line upfront was my sphere and my social media. The more I would put out there, people would then reach out to me saying, Hey, what did you mean by the VA loan doesn't have a credit score or like doesn't have an income limit anymore. So that's, that's what would initiate those conversations is me, not so much the grocery store stuff, but me talking to an attorney or me talking to people within my at regular work day. And those people would know of someone else. It was actually kind of rare when my personal sphere was moving, you know, that year, but it, they knew of someone else. And that's where they, I already became a recommended agent for them. Hey, I know somebody that I already know, like, and trust, you know, let me connect you to them. They can help you sell your house. Yep. Love it. So then were you, were you heavy on social media before this or was that something that was just kind of, you know, clicked and registered and, and grew since you started this real estate journey? I was heavy on social media. Uh, okay. I, you know, but it was completely useless at the time. You know, I, I saw like I was making money from social media then. So now, you know, once I became a realtor, I realized that this is, you know, this is perfect. I can get my, uh, my, I can educate my sphere more and more doing something that I'm already doing already, which is posting and making videos on social media. Doing the video portion was, um, I, I think, a huge increase to my business because previously I didn't really like doing videos. I just would rather do text or like photos, something boring, but that's what everyone else was doing and I needed to stand out. So yeah, I don't care what my hair looks like. I'm going to make a video, you know, and, and I'm not going to like dress up. Uh, this is this is what I wear every single day. I wear a backward hat and a t-shirt. Like, this is me. I am your military realtor. I'm not the one in high heels being like, oh my God, this is such a beautiful kitchen. Don't you love this home? That's not me. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, I love that. All right. So, so you were, cause social media, I mean, these, we, we've been so blessed to have these juggernaut platforms. I mean, look at Facebook, over 3 billion active users on a monthly basis, or um, uh, it's like 2.9 billion or whatever. But look at, you know, Facebook, Instagram, you know, it, 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 like these juggernaut of tools that never existed before. And then we have such a huge contingent of our industry not taking advantage of these. Uh, and I really want to get into strategy because I think that most, at least most that I talk with, not sure what your experience is, but we talk with other realtors or team leaders or brokerage owners. They, they understand the power of it. 
they just don't know what to be posting and what to do and how to utilize these tools. And okay. So before you, I mean, you were on there, we were all, you know, like most of us have social media accounts, but you were using it from an entertainment kind of mm -hmm. perspective. Now you're like, okay, I need to get intentional with this tool and use it with intention. Um, you know, so what does that look like? Like, you know, what are you doing on there to go out there and gain that business, develop that rapport, develop that connection? Because, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I read that 97% of your, or no, sorry, 92% of your business comes from social. That's correct. And these aren't paid I, ads. Correct. Right. I am not paying the only marketing, digital marketing that I pay for is if I have a listing to boost that one property. That's it. So I don't have ads that pop up saying like, I'm your realtor. It's just me. It's completely organic. So I'm an investor as well. And in the beginning, I thought that majority of my clients, being that I speak investor, that majority of my clients would also be investors. I quickly realized that is not the highest and best use of my time. So, but I kept having these like new investors pop into my, slide into my DMs and asking questions. And I realized it's because that's what I was putting out there. I was putting out there my own investing journey, which now I don't. <laughs> um, so if, if it, it really is people will respond to what you post, you know, otherwise, how are they supposed to know what you're up to? How are they supposed to know that you just had, you know, six closings this month and like, you still have time for more clients. So I, it was tailoring the videos of what I'm putting out there to attract the certain like type of client that I'm looking for. If you want listings, talk about what sellers need to do in order to prepare their home, even before they sign a listing agreement with somebody talk about how, you know, you stand out. So I, um, then my second year in the business, when I did majority of referrals, it was, it's because I was putting out a lot of information of, Hey, I'm a military realtor. And I know of other military realtors in other air force spaces that I can connect you to. And that's how, you know, I'm going on 55 referrals currently out there right now, just for just referrals, outbound referrals. So I was putting a lot of my effort into Instagram specifically. And, and Facebook, because that's just what I was used to. But I figured all of this time and effort that I'm putting into video and educating, that's my main thing is, is, is really just educational videos. How am I going to then only limit myself to Instagram and Facebook? I need to step the shit up. I need to hire a video, um, an editor, cause I don't edit. I don't want to learn how to edit. And I need to hire another VA to be able to post on all my all of my accounts, because why am I not on LinkedIn or TikTok or everything else? Right. So right now I have two people that I've hired one edits. Once it's edited, good to go. I send that link to the VA on the Philippines who posted on six different social media platforms, what now seven with threads. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so then, uh, can, can we break down your strategy a little bit more of you know, because with this, it's like, okay, what's the name of real estate? Get people to know you, like you, trust you, be aware of what you do for a living, fall frequently, keep your message in front of frequently, your business grows. And and like, because you, you're you're not just all business on there, you know, mm -hmm. right? Like you're also, like I'm sitting there watching your Instagram. Now I've never like cared about art, but I'm sitting there watching it. I'm like, dude, I want to go like take a pottery class now. <laughs> like, it was I'm, so like, watching, hard. You know, you know, right? So, you know, like, like, but through that, like you're getting, yeah, you're making the awareness that, hey, you know, I'm in real estate. I can help you. Or I, you know, have these connections throughout the country that I can, you know, help make sure you're taking care of through referrals. But you're also bringing in that connection piece where people are getting to know who you are as a person. So like, what is the balance there? How important is that? My balance, I'm actually still trying to figure out the balance, right? Because I, I have seen a decline after I started only posting videos about real estate because, and I realized I also used to post stuff about my index funds and stocks. Those would get the most attraction. Everyone loves the, the sexiness of, of the stock market, but, and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm getting a lot of viewers from this, but that's not my clients. You know, that's, that's not going to bring me real estate business. So right now I, for the most part, very average, I'm posting, I post once a day, every single day, um, about once a week, I post something personal and those always get more likes. Cause it's, it's me as a person, my, my Instagram and my Facebook following were those that knew me prior to me even being a realtor. So it's, I think that that's a good balance with Instagram and tech or Instagram and Facebook for people that already know me and for TikTok too, because that algorithm, that algorithm is different. So 
it's not as much to where people don't care about, you know, what I do on the weekends. It's educational. If, if they find it valuable, they'll stop and they'll message me. Hey, I'm looking to buy in Austin, Texas. Cool. I got a, I got an agent for you. Um, so recently just this past week, I, I actually ran out of content. Like I'm, I'm in a, the bottleneck is now me, which is good. I want it to be me as opposed to somebody else, but I'm like in the middle of reviewing all these videos. So I didn't have enough like, uh, educational real estate stuff. So I posted a lot about like me at the, at the pottery doing that thing for the first time. So hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so then, um, I mean, how, cause now that we're in this attention economy, yeah, right. And we're not just competing against other realtors, but we're competing against all these other brands and everybody's atten- you know, competing for everybody else's attention. I mean, it's getting to be a noisier, noisier space. You know, what have you learned as far as, you know, frequency, you know, to be able to have that impact to stay front of mind? I mean, is it, you know, at least a piece of content a day? Is it, I mean, do you have some, you know, an intentional strategy with making sure you have X uploads and X ways styles on a daily basis? Right now, mine is what a day on now seven platforms. I really tried to figure out, you know, what type of content to put out there and, and how to tailor it. Like, you know, the lights that I have, just the quality of the video has to be somewhat decent, but I really feel like the content, the educational piece is more important. Even if they can't see what color your eyes are, if they realize now that they can use their VA loan twice out at the same time, like, Hey, that's, that's worth it for them. So that's what I'm focusing on now, especially since I listen to a lot of like other um, bigger Instagram and, you know, TikTok realtors where they have a lot of round tables, you know, saying like, Hey, what's working? How do you know what's going to work? And a lot of them end end up saying, Hey, I really don't know what's going to work. I posted something that took four hours, got, you know, very little traction and something that I didn't think took off would take off, took off. So it, I really feel like it's kind of spaghetti on the wall. And I've seen that for myself too. Something that I just half-assed did while I like just woke up and I'm like, Oh, this is, I should probably send this out there, get this out there. half ass, you know, take a walking video of me where the video is shaky, but the content is somewhat good that will get more responses than me, you know, setting up the equipment perfectly and everything. It, it kind of is spaghetti at the wall. Yep. No, I love yeah. it. Yeah. And, and you kind of have to do that. Right. Cause it's like, I mean, they're always changing the different algorithms. You know, like Instagram was so heavy on reels and they, re- you know, to compete with TikTok, and then they realized, okay, we overplayed that. So now they're, you know, essentially trying to keep everything more balanced, you know, right. Um, so there's, yeah. you know, different algorithm for reels versus stories, but they're trying to keep it more well-balanced. And, you know, it's like, as soon as we think we get this figured out, they rug pull. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. So then, Okay. Now do you, because you're, you're having these conversations out of the gate and then eventually it became more, you know, now today in a very quick amount of time, you know, so much, re- you know, became so much referral based. Now, are you being intentional with the relationships that you have? Like when you're having conversations, like driving them, like making sure that you're connected on social. So they're mm-hmm. seeing your stuff. Cause it sounds like you're almost using these platforms as like a social CRM. I am. Yeah. I, I mean, I also do of course use a CRM, but it, it's true. And I actually just the other day, two days ago, I set myself up on client giant and uh, cause I am so bad at giving gifts so bad, like ter- gift giving is like the worst love language, like the lowest of mine. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm thinking back about who are like my VIP, right? Like who always sends me referrals. And there are two of my friends that just, they're always thinking of me. They're across the country. They're not even here in Tucson. So they hook me up with referrals. They hook me up with, you know, whatever. So I wanted them to be on client giant. I actually reached out to one of them who I haven't spoken to in maybe six months. I'm like, Hey, um, I just wanted to, can I, first of all, can I have your address? I want to, there, she was like, oh, I'm in the middle of moving. Like why? I'm like, Hey, I just want to thank you for always sending me business. So, um, I want to give you a small gift. And the next day she texts me saying, Hey, I have a seller for you. <laughs> I'm like, man, the, the more you give, the more it comes back around. And I did not expect that. I just wanted to thank her. Like I am terrible at gift giving. I need to hire this out. That's the way I think. Like, what am I bad at? pay for somebody else to do it. And then that way my friends are taken care of that give me business. So that's, yeah, that's how I'm, I've been operating. Yep. No, I love it. So then, um, uh, so when it comes to when you're, you know, when you, I mean, you did 20 deals your first year, then, then you double, and then you're on pace to double again. A lot of people don't understand this until they experience it, but sometimes growth pains can be harder than slow pains. 
you know, like, like what's it been like for you to be able to continue that scale? What have been the challenges? What are things that you've had to maybe do differently or make sure that you've had in place? Like you mentioned, okay, you had to hire, you know, two VAs for helping with the social content. You know, what have been other things that are continue to allow you to scale at this pace? The very first one was a TC. That's an absolute no brainer. After my very first transaction, I only ever did one transaction without a TC. If you don't have one, you're, you're wrong. Like you are wrong. <laughs> you can grow so much more with somebody else to do all your paperwork. Cause why are you doing it yourself? Of course you can maybe do it like better the first time, or maybe even faster, but that it doesn't matter how fast you can do it. You can use that time to get more clients. So TC, and then it was the editor. And then it was, um, the VA. I also have an assistant. Um, she currently lives in Tucson, but we haven't met in person. So she's a VA right now doing a lot of my other admin that does not require a license. So backend stuff like, Hey, can, can you make sure that this video looks good before it's posted? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sounding stupid, you know, it's just random stuff like that. Check my email. Um, so that has been a tremendous help and it's not at the cost that you might think. And a lot of, in the beginning, I was adding up everything per year, right? Like, oh, if I'm going to add, if I'm going to now pay for an editor, how much would I be paying per year? But that was could, because that's what I was used to being in a W2. Like how much am I going to be making per year? What's my salary annually? And I realized that was a wrong way of thinking. Um, first of all, you can have a fucking free trial period <laughs> you can, or you can just have a short trial period. It doesn't have, you don't have to commit to one year. You can commit to two weeks. Does it seem like you'll be able to work with them? Does, does it seem like they're picking up on what you need to be done? Um, and cut it off after two weeks, if it's not a good fit or, you know, continue it a month, month at a time. So that, that was one hurdle that I realized I had to get over. And so now those are the main four people, but also at the end of my first year in the business, while I was still active duty, I had so many leads that I didn't even have time to reach back out to like they reach out to me. I did not have time to reach back out to them. I didn't even refer them. There's so much money I left on the table because it was just me. And so I realized I had to grow a crew, a realtor crew. And I don't like using the word team because we're not a formal team. Um, so it was just referral base, but someone that I knew that'd be able to use the checklist that I have that you know, specifically, I have some specifically for Tucson and then some just everywhere else of how to run a buyer, an investor, uh, a seller through the whole process. I remember making videos of, um, with a video in, in like the back screen, like the, with the green screen. And I was scrolling through all of my missed phone calls of strange numbers, reaching out to me to help either help them buy or sell. And I, and I posted this video and I'm like, how do I not sound desperate? but I am desperate, you know, like, how do I make this not sound like a scam? I truly am overwhelmed with the leads. I need help. So I, I just made the video. I was like, Hey, I am overwhelmed with these leads. I need help. If you're a realtor, please reach out to me. Nobody did. <laughs> they must've thought it was like too good to be true. Maybe I sounded too desperate, but I'm like, all right, well the, all of these leads. And it was like 30 phone numbers. I remember, um, I just couldn't get back out to. So I, I focused on growing the crew, the realtor crew, and not just in Tucson, this is elsewhere too, like Pensacola, Omaha. Um, so that is what I am continuing to work on now, being that I still have like a lot, a lot of leads and I I'm very grateful for it. And also I know that I've worked my ass off for it. Like I it's, it's, it's not people that like, Oh, just randomly see me. Like I purposely get them to see my content. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my main focus now is continuing to grow the crew. Yeah. And, and so by growing the crew, I mean, you've got your, are you leveraging that? Like if we break down your Tucson business and then your nationwide referral business, right? So then in Tucson, are you leveraging agents, you know, as part of your crew, not a team, just referral base, you know, for your own production where you're, you know, trying to phase out of that. And then your crew and all these other strategic markets where you have a lot of reloads going and taking place. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, that's exactly right. In the in the very, very beginning when I was completely inundated with leads, there were some that I didn't even get a referral for. I was like, hey, just take care of this person. Take care of them so that way they don't think that I don't answer my phone, you know, like that I just say that you're that you work with me. Um, at no cost. It was, it was so bad. Um, and then I'm like, okay, I have more of a grasp as to like how many, you know, who's coming in my CRM got that figured out. Um, and now it's just a referral fee. I have being that I have grown a, a lot of my crew is, are newer agents. 
now I currently, I do have some where I am still uh, in production. So maybe I jumped out of production too quickly. You know, I jumped out of production my second year. I just became like a referral agent, uh, but now I'm, I'm back in it. And I, I actually do like being back in it. So that way I have a pulse on the market. I'm not just talking, you know, I'm not just uh, essentially a recruiter. Um, so I'm back in it, teaching the newer agents, like, Hey, this is, this is how my checklist operates. What questions do you have? So in that way do maybe like one or two transactions with them. And then boom, you got it. Like you understand it right? because we have gone thoroughly through each, you know, buyer and seller. Yep. Yep. So you yeah. refine those processes, those checklists, deliver that to them. Yeah. And then the cool part about that is you get to kind of be picky and choosy of who you want to work with. You Absolutely. Know, like the ones that you don't really want, you can hand off the ones that you want, you can keep. That's where this it, business becomes fun. Yeah. Yeah. For clients and for agents, you know, I had, um, in the beginning, I was so desperate. I was taking on any agent, any agent that said that they wanted to work with me. Cool. Awesome. You're in. <laughs> oh my gosh. No. Uh, so now I'm like very particular as to who I allow in a lot of people will, you know, self-select out before they even join, you know, I, cause I tell them we don't just, we don't give you leads. I, I actually, at this point, I do not give out leads until you have done three buyer transactions already, three seller transactions already. Otherwise you're not going to practice on my, my friends and family. That's not, you know, I have a reputation to uphold. So everyone knows that. And as long as they go through this, this 180 checklist, you know, step checklist for the onboarding process. At that point, I know that you are serious. And that like, if you come to our trainings and you come to, you know, whatever you ask questions, the more I see you trying, the more I want, I want to help you. First of all, I'm financially incentivized to help you. Why not help you? Um, a lot of agents, you know, majority don't make it the first two years in the business. So it, I become a lot more strict with, if I think that they will, that they really just have no idea how to, how to run a transaction, then maybe joining a formal team where it's a 50, 50 split or something crazy like that. Maybe that is best for you at this time. And then come back once you're, once you know how to do transactions. Now with these kind of nationwide, you know, this strategic referral network nationwide. Now are these are, are these like other, you know, kind of military air force towns and is it so it's like in the same niche, you know, or is this, you know, Hey, like, as long as I've got the right person, I'm assuming with referrals, it's, it's based on that reload business, but is that correct? Some, yeah. Majority of, of the, my referrals are, do have some sort of air force nexus or really a, there's a lot of army now too. So just some military nexus, but not everyone that's joined the crew uh, is military or even, you know, knows how to talk military because I also have that investing background too. So, yeah. and so I, I get clients that way and there are agents that are, have never been in the military, would never join the military, which good on them <laughs> that are part of the crew and killing it. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. And, then, and is this, you mentioned earlier that you're with EXP, is this, you know, other EXP agents that you're bringing on or, you know, it's also a strategic way to build your downline with that? Or is this, hey, if this is an agent with another brokerage, but they can, they're amazing, they can get the job done. Because I guess when you're doing referrals through referral, it doesn't matter, you know, which organization they're with. Right. Yeah. With my referrals, I don't care as long as you're good. I don't even, I don't care what brokerage you're with. Um, I, and I, I, I feel like brokerages like to keep it in house, you know, they they'll make more money. Um, I don't care if I get paid two weeks later, I don't give a shit as long as that client got a good transaction, you know? So it's, it's, that's my main goal. Yep. Love it. So, all right. So I'm kind of jumping around here, but a question about, okay, so you're posting a piece of content a day, seven different platforms. You have in a, in a VA doing this for you. Are you guys utilizing any kind of posting tools or you just providing them with a VPN where they can log in and post for you from an organic, like, you know, yeah. on your behalf? He, he uses the, he uses a VPN out there and actually they're just, he just told me the other day that they're cracking down on like VPNs out in the Philippines for specifically for YouTube. So I now have YouTube back on my plate, which I will probably give to my assistant here locally, um, for her to post, because if, if you're to choose one social media, um, account, it should be YouTube, like Google business page, Google's number one website in the world, then YouTube which is a search function. You know, it's not the algorithm like TikTok is where it's just randomly, whatever they get. Um, they purposely looked for best realtor in Tucson and they found you. So that, that lead is ha already has a much higher conversion rate. Um, so that's, 
that's what we do now. As far as his posting schedule, what, what I do now is now that YouTube is back onto my plate. I'm posting it first on YouTube. The VA is downloading that video from YouTube, keeping the same quality and like, you know, voice, not degrading anything. I don't know how he does it, honestly. Um, and then he's just dispersing that into the other platforms, whether he uses a scheduled um, something or another. I don't know. Maybe I should ask him. I don't know. Don't care. He's done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I'm assuming then, you know, other than a YouTube short, if it's a long form on YouTube, you know, the editor is going out there and, and repurposing that, like cutting it up, chopping it up, adding captions, then they can disperse it on reels or TikTok or whatever. Actually, that is done by my assistant here using Opus, O-P-U-S. Okay, yep. Uh, yep. So I signed up for Opus. So worth it. Like it, it yep. will chop up the video already have, you know, the captions on there where you can edit super quick, add some different colors instead of the yellow and green and then repurpose that content. So yeah, that's what my assistant here is doing. Yeah. And then when it comes, cause we spoke a lot about Instagram, um, but when it comes to YouTube and with that YouTube long form, like moving to Tucson, Arizona, um, and I agree, like YouTube is managed to the juggernaut. I've never seen any type of a platform where, where for new business, you know, with such high conversion rates. I mean, it's yeah. just crazy, you know, um, but what are some of the, you know, kind of best practices, things that you've really learned, advice that you would give for those wanting to start their own YouTube channel, you know, because it's a little bit of a science as well. It definitely is. It, it is a lot of science. I would say way more science compared to art than TikTok or, or any of the other social media. So I, I purchased for a whopping $2.99. I purchased TubeBuddy which it goes hand in hand. It's like an extension for YouTube where, and the only, a TubeBuddy offers a lot. The only thing I know how to do on TubeBuddy is the keyword explorer. So I type in a couple of keywords related to the video that I'm about to post. So, you know, how to be a referral agent 2023, and it gives you a score. So you can see like unweighted versus unweighted. You can see other videos um, of that topic and who or which account owns owns a lot of the videos in that section. So that, that helps a lot. I've actually been on a bigger, like a really big Mr. Beast, uh, kick right now. Cause I'm, cause yeah. he's Mr. Beast, you know, with the biggest YouTube <laughs> following ever. And I realize I'm, I have to switch up my, the way that I do things. Cause he does the title first. He thinks of title first, which is the last thing I was doing. And then he does thumbnail and then he does the video. So um, as long as that, that title is, you know, the perfect score, then he'll make the thumbnail and he pays, I mean, like 40 K for one thumbnail. I'm not there yet, you know? Um, so that I had been doing the opposite. I had been doing the video and like, Oh, what do I talk about this video? Oh, I talk a lot about the VA loan. Okay, cool. And then I make a title of the VA loan, but making sure that in the first five to 10 seconds of your, of your long form YouTube video matches the title and then matches the description, the first line of the YouTube description. At that point, the YouTube algorithm will be able to see, okay, yes, no shit. That is what they're talking about. Let's push it for anybody that look that searches those keywords. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's insane, man. It, it's like when I first started doing YouTube, which was a long time ago. I mean, I think I started my channel in 2012, you know, wow. um, yeah, yeah. And but it used to be like dude, I put out a video, no, no thumbnail, no intention of the title, <laughs> you know, and it'd get 20, 30,000 views. Now I do that same thing and I'm lucky to get like a hundred, you know, right? Oh like I mean, the game has changed so massively, but the upside to that is if you take the time to understand and put in the work, man, you can get this thing just cranking. Yeah. And it's really and I might be talking at like a I don't know. I might be talking at a higher level where that might scare some people out, even with you getting a hundred views, as opposed to like the 20,000 they used to get, there is still room for you as a realtor. So if you are not on YouTube, get on there. And like, I don't know if you have, I, I have a perfectionist problem where I, I want everything to be perfect. I had to snap out of that when I switch to becoming an entrepreneur because done is better than perfect. So as long as you're posting something out there about you being a realtor in your city and posting, you know, Allie, the agent, Tucson, Arizona, you will come up and those leads are already going to be way more than you talking to somebody in a grocery store that hopefully their aunt one day wants to sell their house with you. Yep. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And the cool thing is too, is like, you don't need that many views. Cause our, it's like, we're trying to be, you know, YouTubers where we're making all that money off AdSense, right. It's, you know, cause we sell such a high end product. Like, like one of my agents on my team here in Phoenix, you know, I mean, her, I mean, she has some videos where she gets thousands, but I mean, most it's like three, 400, you know, but dude, like, you know, March, but now this was not her normal month or no month is about half this, but March, she did 10 deals just from a YouTube channel. Nice. You know, it's just crazy, dude, you know, um, and, and usually she does about, you know, but just by herself, you know, between five and 10 deals wow. a month, like I'll take that all day long. <laughs> right. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and with our price points, it's pretty good business. Right. Um, yeah. okay. So then from there, when it comes to the YouTube video itself, right. Cause you gotta, you know, you gotta create great content. Um, um, you know, but you gotta get people to reach out. Like, have you found any kind of best practices from like inserting call to actions, you know, when it comes to like the actual video itself? I have gone back and forth about where to place the call to action because typically it, the call to action is at the very, very, very end where they already got the juicy, you know, the media information. Cool. Thank you. And on to the next video that they're going to watch. And then they didn't realize that your call to action was, Hey, I can, I can help you. I'm a realtor. Um, so I am going to start placing my call to actions in the beginning. Um, like, Hey, I'm a realtor in Tucson, Arizona. I can help you buy a house. And then like, and then hit the title. So also having the call to actions in the description too helps a ton. But in the beginning, I used to think I, I don't want to be that salesy person and like, call me, call me. My business friends on referrals. I fucking hate that. <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay, no shit. But also what does that mean to the average person who doesn't know that? So um, it's it's inserting it in between, you know, or even in the middle of your long form video, that'll that'll work just as long as, I guess the, the best videos right now are like 10 to 12 minutes long. If you're doing long-term long form video on YouTube, 10 to 12 minutes long, get the information out there. Don't do a lot of fluff. People don't care about fluff. Of course, you might have a similar, you know, some like a statement or two to say about you as a person or a client that you recently helped. That's social proof. That's good. Um, but other than that, don't start it off with, Hey, I just wanted to pop on here and say, you know, happy Thursday. Thanks for following. No, people have long left your video just get get to the point yep yep no love it so then what and i know it can be tough to to track because they kind of all live in the same ecosystem um uh but like what percentage of your business is coming from youtube versus like instagram versus you know facebook actually uh i've only gotten one agent um uh, from youtube i have right yeah, as of right now, I have one buyer lead, uh, but no closed transactions from YouTube. I'm I'm in the beginning, st very beginning of stages okay, of YouTube. Yeah. It's all been Instagram and Facebook where people already knew me, liked me, trust me. So it was their friends and family that they referred me to. So like, for example, I posted a, an open house that I did like a year and a half ago. Um, I did like a short story on my Instagram. I'm like, hey, I'm at an open house. I have champagne, come on over. And <laughs> someone else, someone else out in like, the middle of Texas sent it to someone else who was PCSing to Tucson and was like, Hey, this might be a good fit for you. She closed in the house, made an offer that day, closed in the house. And that was from an Instagram story that I like half ass did. Again, it wasn't like very, very intentional. I'm like, Hey, does anybody want, want to drink champagne with me? Yep. <laughs> I'm alone. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, I'm just now getting into YouTube. Yep. Love it. So then, and it, and it could be, when I said, it, it, you know, it could be tough to track because it's on the same ecosystem. Like what we found is right, a lot of people might, discover us on youtube but then they might then go hunt us down on instagram because like on youtube okay they're getting to because I mean, that's more business you know right like yeah, they're yeah. you know getting to to you know know you and know the market with that but then they you know might connect with us on instagram to get know get to know who we are more they'll slide in through it you know instant you know dm but then once we start working with them you know well how did you know how, how'd you first discover us oh no i first discovered on youtube and when we think yeah. it was something like it, it's you know those those Again, it's that, that ecosystem that's all together, right? So it really is. And and even if you were to try to track it down, um, you know, how did you first hear about me? They might have forgotten, you know, they might have followed you on Instagram for a couple of months now. They forgot they even originally found you from a friend who sent you the YouTube video. It, it's it, it's hard to track down. Yep. Yep. All right. So then I mean, I was looking at, you know, some of the stuff that you sent me over. It's like, okay, you've got it broken down what your per hour is on buyer what your per hour is on referral, what your per hour is on, on sellers, you know, how many combos, new business nurtures you have to have every day, 
you know, how important has it been for you to understand and know your numbers um, throughout your business? What impact has it made? It's everything. Oh, that that's everything without that number. And I started off. So I'll, I'll start with my salary. You know, I wanted to make $308,000 a year. And I heard that from a random podcast. Hey, the average agent that, that makes, that has six conversations about real estate every day that they make an average of 308. I'm like, boom, done. <laughs> Let's use that. So I started from 308,000. I broke it down to how many conversations is that uh, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily. So, and that's six conversations every like seven days out of the week, because I probably work even harder on the weekends. Um, I have a problem. So <laughs> six days, six conversations every single day. And, you know, knowing that not all those conversations are going to lead into an appointment. Um, but every appointment that I have 50% of them will end up in, in a seller, um, et cetera. So it was in the beginning when I wanted to make sure who am I hiring and is it worth me paying them this amount of money? So I wanted to make sure how much am I making per hour working with buyers versus sellers versus referrals. And I, um, I, I had a, um, a, a, I guess, a what do you call it? Like I knew what to compare it to because I was making a hun- at the time, 107,000 as a mil- as a major in the air force. So $107,000 divided by how many hours a week that I work. Cool. I know, I know my hourly way, my wage pretty much. And I didn't want to go do anything below that. So if I found a task that could be done by somebody else that was below that, for example, editing, posting, um, you know, sending a couple of emails out, I was going to hire that out knowing that at that point, like my, my, my hourly pay is worth more than that. So then I wanted to see if, um, I'm such a big nerd and this is all done like just via Excel sheet, but I, I wanted to see is our listings actually the way to go, you know, like, cause I actually kind of like working with buyers more. So I broke down, including my dead leads, my leads that never, tr- that never, um, ended up closing. I broke down per hour, how many hours I spent with each person that I ever worked with, whether or not we ended up in a sale. And I did that for the sellers, my buyers and referrals. And I disproved in my personal business that listings for me are not the way to go. Uh, I actually make the most working with buyers. I make $453 per hour working with buyers. And that's because I I mean, I had majority of that during when I first got licensed during the biggest, you know, COVID peak. And when it was the hardest to get your buyer's offers accepted, I had my shit down, you know, like client expectations, like, no, you, you know, no shit will be able to narrow down knowing exactly what you want versus need versus, you know, what a deal breaker is. You'll find that the amount of properties that are on your list truly are only between five and seven homes. And that's, that's the truth. I'm not trying to like manipulate them. Like no shit. You'll, your, your list is not going to be 20 homes long. We're not going to be looking at 20 homes. We'll look at five that like no shit are ones that you want to place an offer on. Um, so, and then for referrals, I made an in-between amount and that was like $360 per hour working with each referral with finding the agent, um, communicating with the agent, negotiating like the, the referral fee, I do 30% and then, um, putting everyone in contact together. And then the follow-up pinging in every couple of, you know, weeks, Hey, how's it going? Are you under contract yet? Et cetera. And making sure that the, that the buyers have a good, uh, transaction, or if not, Hey, let me find you another one. And let me put this agent as my never to do work with list because they never even got back to you. So, and then same thing with sellers. And I realized that I make the least amount per hour with sellers. So it was, it was crazy. I didn't know that. I'm glad I did that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do the same thing with, with, you know, myself personally and all my agents on my team here in Phoenix, where, you know, within our monthly p I mean, we break it down, you know, based on buy business, sell business. I mean, how much it costs us, how much it costs our time, you know, cause I mean, my whole entire career, like I've been told that, oh, dude, you got a list to last. The name yeah, of the yeah. game is in the listings and the sellers. And, you know, I've just found that like, look, there's a sub, you know, a, a contingent of our industry that maybe that's true for. There's also a lot that that's not true for, you know? So it's like, hey, where are you strong? Where are you weak? What do you enjoy? Mm-hmm. You know, plus I sort of looking down this. I'm like, if the long game goal is to maximize lifetime value of each customer, well, the lifetime value of each customer through repeat referral business is much heavier on the buy side. Like I love listings, don't get me wrong, but I've also tried to keep my business always at least 50% buy side 
because they become those raving fans, right? You know, like of, of that, you know, it's like 90% of repeat referral business, at least for me, historically has come from the buy side, not necessarily the sell side, you know? So, but it takes breaking this down so we can really understand what, you know, what it's like for us in our own businesses. Yeah. Without that, I would have continued only trying to get listings and, uh, you know, like now I'm like, Hey, wait, buy, I got my buyer shit down. Yeah. Uh, so, but either way, of course, my favorite is referrals, especially since I don't have the time to handle. Uh, honestly, I don't have the time to handle more than five clients at one time. And that's with me doing the podcast. That's with me doing everything else. Uh, so I am switching to try to go back to mainly being a referral agent. Yeah. Well, plus that, you know, investor portion of you, you know, I mean, it's just a sense, it's an element of leverage, right? Absolutely. Yep. So then, um, all right. So, you know, you mentioned that 40% are you, you heard a stat that agents, the average agent's business is down 40% this year, which makes sense. Cause if you look at transaction volume nationwide down 37% year to date, you know, um, here in Phoenix is down 39%. So it makes sense that, you know, that's down your business is up, but you're also, you know, working your ass off, you're intentional, you know, so whether it be you or your agents or so if anybody's watching or listening to this and they're, they're one of those that their business is down, like what is it taking in this market to go out there and, and I mean, are you having to work that much more? Like what, what's your focus like? What, what does it look like to not just keep your business the same and survive, but you're thriving right now? I don't watch the news. I do not like, I am so focused on me and my crew and you know, what's next, my clients that that's it. I mean, I, I also have a very internal locus of control where I, not to get like too philosophical here, but I'm, I don't believe in God. Like I am. So if it's wrong, it's up to me to fix it. And, you know, like I, I definitely understand how like people will just at some point it's overwhelming. Like, Hey, I need somebody else to take control and I, I can, I can get that. And, you know, I can understand that. Um, but me as a person, I'm like, Hey, if, if I, if my business is slow, it's because of me, it's not because of the market. It's not because of anything else I need to fix it. What can I do? So being very intentional as to, um, where your hours are being spent, you know, like, who are you talking to every day? Are you in an office bullshitting, which was my background in the military. We'd go in and just bullshit all day, do one hour work, leave. And that was it. And now I'm an entrepreneur and every minute is valuable. So being very strategic. If you are already posting on social media, go on all platforms, hire somebody out in the, like a, a VA out in the Philippines, pay them $250 per month to pay, to post one post every single day on seven different platforms. Um, it's leverage, you know, do not, there's a reason the pilots don't serve the drinks. You are your own, you're the CEO. You need to make the proper choices to be able to not do lower task items. Hopefully that, I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're just extremely intentional, dude. You know, right. I mean, that's you're you're focused, you're intentional, you're a leader, taking hundred percent responsibility, you know, I mean, because what, what do victims do? Victims give up their power, their control to outside circumstances, you know, because I mean, I do it in my almost, you know, 18, 19 years of doing this. It's like, you know, I've seen the two biggest booms. I've seen the biggest crash in recorded history everything in between. And it, there's always been massive opportunity. You know, the market's always good for somebody. And as long yeah. as we take control, like you're talking about, take responsibility, there's always opportunity to be had, but so many people want to hide behind these reasons, these excuses to not go out there and do the work. Yeah. A really good book that I recommend is Traction by Gino Wickman. That that's what got me my six. I, otherwise I wouldn't have known to focus on a number who cares, you know, like whatever, if I feel, if I feel like I've done enough conversations then I'm good to go. No, you will, you know, you might feel like you had a lot of conversations, but it was one heavy one with one person and that's not enough. That is nowhere near enough. So, um, and I'm happy to share, you know, the spreadsheets that I have, it's really nothing fancy, you know, not, no pivot tables, anything like that. It's just, it's a good template in case you wanted to be able to track your own numbers. Cause I have one per hour, like a, one spreadsheet that's like per hour, how much are you making per referral by your seller? And the other, another spreadsheet that's, um, conversations, you know, working backward with the conversion, like how many attempts versus how many conversations that I actually have versus how many appointments that I end up setting. And then of course the lagging indicator indicators of how many closings did I have? Yep. Yep. No, I love that. So then, um, yeah, cause then that's cool because then you can start seeing, 
okay, well, is my appointment set to conduction ratio low? Okay, how can I fix that? Is my appointment set to closing rate? Like you can sit there and break down, you know, not only, hey, here's a winner, it's problematic. It's almost like when you go to a doctor and you're sick, okay, they're going to do a test, run your vital signs to try to pinpoint where that thing is. But unless we're tracking that kind of data, we can't pinpoint what we need to fix in our business. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you see that you've, you know, messaged a thousand people, you know, this past month and you only got a hundred people responding, your message was bad. <laughs> Fix it. <laughs> Maybe you do try something else. Um, but it, it, I mean, that's a thing too. You're never going to get it down to perfection. Like once you get it down where like the conversion is high, something's going to change, you know, and that's just, that's just life. That's just business. So you um, have to know that even, even once I get this conversion, some always assume something's going to happen. So that way, you know, like when, when that time comes around, you're not mad that like, oh man, you know, why is nobody responding to this type of mailer yet? Or, you know, whatever it, you have to be flexible. So how do you, how do you stay so focused? You know, cause it's so easy in this attention economy and to get distracted. You mentioned you don't watch the news. You're just kind of obsessed with an obsession. In my opinion is a good thing. I don't know anybody that's ever created success that wasn't obsessed. So um, um, but like, I mean, how do you stay so focused and not allow yourself to get distracted? Number one, two main things that come off the top of my head right now. Number one is having had a no shit, like deep discussion with my spouse where I, as I was separating from the, separating from the military, I told her, I was like, Hey, this is going to be a ton of time for me, but I just want to make sure that I give it a hundred percent because otherwise I don't know what I'm going to do when I separate and we're going to have problems, you know, um, we, could we survive on, off one income? Absolutely. But did we want to No, that's not what we were used to. So that was having like an, a partner that actually knows what you plan on doing and therefore dedicating time, like time block time with your family, with your spouse. So, um, and then number two, is Shelby. I got this from Shelby and Shelby's a shit. She goes, I never answer phone calls. Cause I, I had like a call with her. I'm like, dude, I, I can't with this. Like they're calling me. I don't have time in the middle of a, an appointment, blah, blah, blah. She's like, why the fuck are you answering phone calls? And I was like, what do you mean? They're clients you know, or they're potential clients. And she's like, stop answering your phone. And I'm like, Whoa, Shelby, you're a little bit extreme right now. Um, but that's what I did. I stopped answering my phone and it has been night and day difference where first of all, 60% of my phone calls are spam. So that's great. You know, I'm not wasting my time anymore with them. If they're spam, they'll leave a voicemail that's spammy. I'll immediately block them. Um, I block a lot, I block a lot of shit, you know, a lot of crypto investors and all that, but that alone being able to put my phone on either airplane mode or, you know, just not answer any phone calls and having that automated thing on my iPhone, which I'm sure you can do on Android as well saying, Hey, I'm currently with a client right now. Is there anything that I can help you via text? And a lot of times clients where they have some questions or even realtors that have questions that they can answer themselves. They just want it to be handheld. They'll figure it out on their own. And if not, then yeah, cool. It's not, I'm not saying I don't ever answer the phone. I, I will call people on my time when I know that I have a dedicated hour to spend with them or 30 minutes to spend with them, but it's on my time. Otherwise you're always playing defense. You're always, you're never proactive about your day that those are huge. Like though that utilizing a calendar, um, all of my, I use Google calendar, all my appointments, like no shit appointments are in red. I have little, a lot of green things like tasks to do to fill up the white space. There is no white space on my calendar. Everything is filled up. It's, it's overwhelming. You know, people that aren't used to it, look at my calendar and they go, what the fuck, yeah. <laughs> but it works, you know, and that's how I'm able to do this. Yeah. Now, have you, have you always been like, why, like, is, like, have you been wired this way or, you know, did a lot of that kind of discipline and focus come from, you know, being in the military or is this stuff that you just had to learn in this business? That's a great question. I've never been asked that. And I recently realized that I have never been this way prior to like this focused and like dedicated because in the military, like I said, you smoke and joke, you, you literally do maybe two hours worth of work, like actual work. And then the rest is lunch and bullshitting and answering phone calls, which are a waste of your time and then going home. I never once had to use my, you know, outlook you know, calendar 
I never had to learn what inbox zero is. All we would do is just complain. And I, the more I spent a decade in the air force being this way where I'm like, ah, what's what? Oh yeah. We have a meeting every Tuesday. Oh yeah. That's right. I'll remember, you know, I'll, I'll have, I'll rely on my brain to remember if I were to do that now, I would I would have no business, you know, like it's, you cannot rely on your brain, but I think it was always me as a person where I have always, I guess, been, um, I'm actually a type B personality, believe it or not. Um, but it, it, being in this type of business and industry brings out my like ownership, you know, it's, it's full ownership. It's your reputation and I need to do a good job. Therefore I'm going to do what it takes. So it's, as soon as I left the military, it was a 180. I'm like, Whoa, I got to learn what a calendar is. Oh my God. I got to get these, these emails down and I just have to organize myself. There was no, no organization like that before. So you mentioned that, you know, during your first year, you almost hit that phase where you were burnout or you're starting to feel that burnout. Um, what do you do now today to kind of balance the, I don't know if balance is the right word, but to also, you know, enjoy life or give yourself that pause so you can rest, recuperate. So you're not experiencing that burnout. I struggle with this. I put it on my calendar that every Tuesday starting at 2 PM, I am done. Like I'm done working for the day. And yellow on my Google calendar is my vacation or like time off. Cause I, yellow is a great color. And uh, so, but every Tuesday I'm like, you know what, why would I drive one hour to go? Cause Tucson's really big. Why would I drive one, drive one hour to go get a massage, be there for an hour, maybe hour and a half, and then drive the one hour back. That's like almost three and a half hours that I could be working. And it's, it's total, it's maybe I need some, maybe I need to go see a therapist for this shit, but like I. I, I, I love reading, you know, just fiction. I haven't read a fiction book, you know, probably like 10 years. <laughs> um, ever since I discovered, discovered financial independence, I have been all fucking in. Sorry, I curse a lot. <laughs> That's yeah, okay. No, it's to get you a done more <laughs> podcast. So you're good. Dude. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have just been completely obsessed. So when I need to calm down uh, and like just refresh, my thing I know is to get a massage and to read a fiction book on my hammock. Um, even it's, even if it's 30 minutes, cause 30 minutes I can do, you know, as opposed to driving one hour, one way to get a massage, but that's, that's it. Um, I used to say vacation, but I actually don't like traveling too much. And I know that's like the opposite of what everyone says, but one, every single time I go on a plane, I get sick and I'm done traveling, man. I, the air force already sent me to too many locations. I just want to break. I want to chill. I want to be a couch potato. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it was Seth Godin. You know, I heard him in an interview one time. He was saying that like he was, you know, I don't know, on a vacation because he you know, forced himself to take, I don't know, with, with his wife, you know, whatever. But anyway, the, he, he's in his hotel and he's got his laptop up and he's working and somebody came to him and like made a comment of like, oh, I feel so sorry for you that you're having to work during a vacation. And he looks at him and he, he's like, I feel so sorry for you that you built a life that you need a vacation away from. Ooh. You know, so, you know, a lot of people, you know, cause I, I feel this, like I hate vacations, you know, I don't enjoy <laughs> taking days off, but I'm like, what's wrong with building a life that you love so much and doing what you love so much that you don't need a break from it. Like, yeah, like, you know, I don't know. I'm a little biased, but I'm like, I think everybody else has this backwards. I think you and I've got it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have it right. Yeah. So then, um, all right. So, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, long-term vision. I mean, you've only been at this, you know, a couple short years. You know, like, where do you see yourself taking this thing? My goal. So last month, actually, I, I hit my financial independence goal. So I, I, of course, I want to keep that sustainable. It's only been two months so far where my passive and residual income has surpassed my cost, my living expenses. So June and July, I have not needed to work. June and July, ironically, I've worked the hardest. You know, I feel like I work harder and harder every month. And I, I hit the number and like, I celebrated internally, you know, like for maybe an hour, I'm like, holy crap, I made it something that I've worked for very hard for five years. And I've sacrificed, I've sacrificed, um, 50% of my income during the military was spent, was put toward real estate and, and index funds. And I made it. And within the hour at the end of that hour, I was like, okay, let's up them. 
let's up the goals. Like what's next. And I already, I already became like the accomplishment sense of accomplishment over, <laughs> you know, like yeah. what is next. And uh, yeah, I probably should see somebody, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, so overall my real estate, uh, goals are to continue doubling my business every, every year. And I, as far as the leads go for clients, I know that I can do that. Um, now it's just a matter of how do I have enough agents to be able to handle the leads? Do I have my checklist, you know, very tied down? I mean, the buyer and seller checklist, they're, they're good. They're beefy. They're each a hundred and almost like 200 steps long. Um, so nothing is forgotten unless it's a very fluke, you know, um, circumstance, but I, we have about 30 agents in the crew right now, and I'm looking to, by the end of 2024, up that to 200 and then just continuing, hopefully like doubling after that. I like doubling. Doubling's, yep. doubling's a good, yeah. Two X is good. <laughs> yep. I love it. I love it. So speaking of that, if anybody's watching or listening to this, cause we're all realtors or real estate, you know, team leaders, brokers, I'm mean, all attached to the real estate space here. Um, if anybody is interested in, in continuing to follow you on this success journey, or maybe they have some interest of talking to you about joining a referral network, um, where's the best place to, to follow you, to reach you, to get in touch with you. We know it's not calling you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not calling me. Sorry. I'll be like, Hey, I'm with a client. Even if I'm on the toilet, I'm with the client. <laughs> Can I help you via text? <laughs> um, Instagram, but I know that not everybody likes Instagram. I'm on all social media. Um, Ali, the agent that's spelled A L I the agent. Uh, so that's, that's honestly the best way. But if you do want to text me, I'm all about text. Uh, should I leave my phone number? Yeah. Great. Okay. Cool. It's uh, area code 914, because I'm from Westchester, uh, 318-4918. So happy to talk. And yeah, it's it's. I feel like we have a really good gig. We, I give out all my resources for free at no cost. You know, there's it's not a team split. There's no team split. Yep. Yep. Love that. Um, all right. So then I got two last questions for you. Um, of of your, because you got 30 agents now inside your 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 crew, you know, you're part of your, your crew here. Um, what are you seeing? Cause I'm sure that some of those, and maybe they all crush it and kick ass, but you know, maybe you've had some that haven't, you know, um, but from being, you know, kind of that mentor perspective, if you will, what are the differences that you see between those that are crushing it and that do well versus those that just become obsolete? How bad they want it. You know, it's, it's a mixture of how bad they need this to, to work for them. And a lot of it is expectations. Did, did they do enough research as to what being an agent really is? It's not just opening up the super box and showing a kitchen it's numbers. It's a sales funnel. Do you like that? Do you like reaching out to people? Do you like, uh, putting stuff out? It's marketing, you know? And so if for some reason, a listener is not an agent yet podcasts, you know, continue listening to podcasts like this, that where people go over their struggles and their pain points and their successes. Does that something that you feel like you, you match with? So I feel like, um, you know, is, is every single person that's in the 31 person downline crushing it? No. Um, a lot of them, majority of them actually are new agents. And so, th and just statistically speaking, 87% do not last within the first two years. It's, it's, how much are you willing to learn on your spare time? Is this everything for you? Cause it's not everything for everyone. And that's okay. You know, just similar to the feelings that I had about in the military, like, oh man, military is not for me. I felt like a quitter. And I guess technically I was, but it's okay that the military was not for me. And so it, it's not for everyone, but you don't even have to love it. You know, you don't have to love it, but if you want to make this work, you will, that's it. Yep. Yeah, powerful stuff. So then, all right, so if Allie today could have a conversation with yourself two years ago, you're sitting on a park bench and you could give yourself a couple pieces of advice, knowing everything you know now today that you feel would have, I mean, you've already had so much success, but that would you feel would have even fast forwarded this success trajectory that you're on. What would those couple pieces of advice look like? First, if I were to talk to Allie from two years ago, I would, the first thing I would do I would slap myself across the face and say, get the fuck out of the military. Like you do not need a W2. You have it within you to make your own living, to make your own lifestyle, to take back your life. <laughs> um, after that, 
then I would say, start with, um, start with YouTube. If I were to do it again, like honestly, to get clients to come to you, right? Cause that's, that's what the name of the game is. Like, how do you want to be reaching out to clients forever? No, you want them to come to you. So start with that right away and start on YouTube. Um, put more focus specifically on who you want to work with, what type of client, whether that's VA loans for buyers or, you know, um, I don't know, a Korean speaking community for, you know, sellers, it doesn't matter whatever your target niche is, which you need a niche, do not, you can't work with everyone. Otherwise you will tire yourself down completely working with clients that do are not deserving of your time. So focus on people that, you know, that you like interacting with already and make that your target audience. And, and yeah, I would say like, just go on YouTube, start, start getting your name out there, get over the fear of video. Who cares? They're going to be seeing you anyway. Yep. Love it. Powerful words of advice. And Ali, we truly appreciate you taking time out of busy to be here. This has been absolutely amazing. Joshua, thank you so much. This was great. Yeah, 100%. My friend, and those watching, listen, as always, we truly appreciate you guys being here, all your support. Keep crushing it, keep kicking ass, and we will see you next time. Peace. Peace.